Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Ask Anything presented by Mosher Consulting. I'm your host, Angel Leon, Mosher's Director of Personnel. We're glad you're with us for today's episode. And with us today is one of our repeat offenders here on Ask Anything. Mosher's Director of our Managed Services Department, Jim Timmerman, is here. You might remember Jim from several of our episodes involving our Managed Services team. Most recently, he was on season two in our ransomware episode. But today we're talking about disaster recovery and backups. You might think, wait, didn't you guys talk about that at some point? We did. But this episode will be more geared towards the cost of not having those things in place in case of an emergency. You certainly won't want to miss this. Jim, it's great to have you back on Ask Anything. How have you been? Good. Thanks for having me back. Appreciate it. Excited to talk about some new subjects. Absolutely. And this is this is a subject that I think from an IT perspective should be on everybody's mind from a general perspective. I mean, you can apply disaster recovery to just about anything in your life, honestly. Mm -hmm. But before we dive in, let's start again by defining what disaster recovery is. Well, that's actually a great question. Is, is, you know, a lot of times people think of disaster recovery as, oh, my building's on fire, or um, we've been vandalized, or there's flooding, or something, or tornadoes whipped through, or something physically has happened. But in today's environment, you know, it's, it's more than just that. It's, it's the idea of human error, you know, vandalism, hacking, anything that can allow for loss of productivity really falls into that category. And it's not just across you know the entire enterprise it could be segmented into specific applications specific environments and so forth that that need to be addressed and looked at as as we you kind of look at and, and oversee what what it, what constitutes a disaster recovery plan well you mentioned something about physical assets such as your building and, and that's something that i want to ask you about because in the past Mm -hmm. You might have been worried about physical assets such as your building or that little room in the corner that's supposed to be your server room and it's 100 degrees every time you walked in there. But <laughs> now, nowadays, the worries are a little bit different, right? Uh, what can you tell us about the differences between the way people worried about these types of things maybe 10, 15 years ago to the worries we face right now? Because those are completely different. Yeah. I mean, even, even in that aspect is, you know, that on-premise server room and the data center locally is still a key part of a lot of companies' environments, but you also have to look at it from a cloud perspective that, you know, you can't always guarantee that something isn't going to happen with an Azure or AWS that will allow for any kind of outage or data loss. So in, in even ensuring that you have that uh, information backed up, is key as well as your your ability to recover that you know we've seen some examples of um some of our clients that have a lot of that use a SaaS provider for some of their applications well technically that's their data so if something happens to that company or, or to that application that also impacts your data so by having the ability to you know back that data up and also put it somewhere where you can recover it quickly through a, a backup policy is very helpful because i can name a couple examples where we've had a client at the time wasn't our client but became a client because of a situation where they were using a SaaS application that company got hacked therefore they were basically uh panicking to a point of what do we do what do we do well do you have this have that they're like no well we had to spin some things up very quickly in order to get them up and running and then put some preventative measures in place to ensure that even though they're still going to continue to use that application, that they have access to that data, they can back it up and recover it as needed. So again, it's even if it isn't on-prem, you still have to protect it. You still have to ensure that you've got copies of it should any kind of issue come up. So. Right, because you mentioned hacking, and I would say mm -hmm. that would be your number one worry about anything in the cloud, mm -hmm. right? Correct. Yeah, oh yeah. I mean, there's, you know, it's a great, instance where it's, you know, not only are you at risk, but the companies you deal with are at risk too. So, you know, you've got to ensure that even though they've got some safeguards in place, you still have to have yours in place to ensure that, you know, you can still manage and get to your data and, and, and become productive. Basically have a backup to the cloud kind of a thing. 
Oh yeah, definitely. It's not unusual to see companies that'll have a SaaS that they'll actually back up and, or actually copy their data over locally and then back that up to a cloud solution in order just to make sure that, you know, they have it. So in case of an emergency or any kind of situation happens, plus also too, you know, there's, there's different means that you can use within that and having that locally. So if they you know choose to switch vendors, the, the migration piece of that is a lot more simpler and also they can report against it a lot better. So there's, so there's some, some other value to doing that. So. <laughs> so- and I think my next question, you might have sort of quasi answered it, but I'm still going to ask it anyway, because I think it deserves a full, complete answer. And that is, what would you say would be the main goal of disaster recovery? Mm-hmm. Um, actually, the main goal is the recovery piece of it and how quickly you can stand up an environment. And when we say that, we mean more of how can, how quickly can we be productive again? Because with anything, you know, where there's disaster or, or any kind of uh, outage, it's a loss of productivity. So as an organization, depending on what you do, you know, a lot of times we have become so dependent on IT and applications and being connected to the internet and having email and all this, that that becomes critical. So any time down is loss of productivity and income. So the goal of that is to understand, okay, how quickly can we recover? Okay, so what's the time frame? That's the key thing. And the, the other side of that is how much data are we losing? Okay, so what's the loss of data? So if it goes down, our backups are every day. So we could lose a day's worth of data. Is that acceptable? How much is that going to cost you in the long run? You know, with that, all that needs to be analyzed and determined because, again, all backup solutions are not created equal. You know, there's there's different ways of doing it, and and that's the main factor of of what you need to figure in when you're determining what your policy is going to be. Yeah, and that brings up a good question. So beyond the monetary aspect of things, because obviously, as you were mentioning, everything has a cost, whether that's productivity and everything that you mentioned before, because this could anything within the SaaS recovery could cost you an X amount of money, but it's not just about that money piece, isn't it? That is true. It's not. And the way uh, a lot of some of the disaster recovery solutions in themselves have become extremely affordable. You know, if you look back, you know, within the last five years to have an off, you know, off-prem cloud backup, was really expensive. Nobody thought of it. They all thought about, okay, I got to have a sand in my environment, or I got to replicate my data to another location across town. Now with the emergence of, you know, a lot of the cloud providers, AWS and Azure, uh, especially have really provided these kind of almost turnkey solutions that help companies in those situations where it is affordable. And basically you're paying a storage cost versus actually a compute cost. Speaking a little bit of when you have that disaster recovery set up in place, mm-hmm. how often should organizations or ZIOs or CTOs be verifying their disaster recovery setup? So as, as we look at that and how often they should be looking, not only looking at it, but they should be testing it. They should establish their policies really based upon kind of two things. What's that risk of loss? Meaning how much data am I willing to lose? Uh, and then they build their policies to that. But, but the big key on that is the recovery, okay? Is that if, if something does happen, what is it gonna take for me to recover that environment and get back up and running? So as they look at it, they should not just say, okay, hey, this is what it costs me to do this backup, but how quickly can I recover? And are the assumptions that I'm making on the recovery time valid? So therefore testing is, the key, is a key. So. Uh, we've seen instances where we've worked with clients, uh, a new clients that they haven't had a disaster recovery done, test done in three or four years. They're just like, oh, we know it works because, you know, well, do you really? Are you sure? What are the gotchas? How long is it going to take? What's the risk involved? And what are the things that are going to come into play? Therefore, we know what to do to remediate those should we actually have to recover in a non-test environment or, or, or recover quickly. Well, I see, I see this as when you do a drill, you know, as a, as a, I don't know if you were going to do an emergency drill on tornadoes. So Mm -hmm. let's say there's a tornado coming for our our office, you know, God forbid, and people have to go somewhere 
in order mm -hmm. to be safe? What's the what's the safest location nearby? Where can we go to find shelter, etc.? I view disaster recovery in IT just like that. I mean, if you don't practice that, people mm -hmm. aren't going to know where they're supposed to go if there's a tornado, if there's a fire within the building. Where are those exits that mm -hmm. you need to go to in order to escape the building if it's on fire? I view disaster recovery in IT just as oh yeah, as way as that. Oh yeah, uh, I, I totally agree, and that's and that's a way a, a lot of the way we look at it too is because you know everybody just kind of says oh we've got something in place there's a policy there's a document there's this is what we do we have backups but is it you know you really are unsure of that until it's actually tested mm -hmm. and at times you know some companies get to test a little bit more sooner than others because they have a little bit more older environments that they know that sometimes things go bad and they've got to recover quickly. But even in today's new environments, even cloud environments, you know, understanding what that is and testing it to ensure that it works is the key because like anything, it's, you know, it's an insurance policy that you have the ability to always check on. And, and how often would you say every organization that has a disaster recovery, mm -hmm. how often should they test that out? At least yearly, you know, that, that covers an opportunity for them usually during that, you know, usually identified during slow times of the year. Uh, a lot of times around the, the Christmas holiday, a lot of people do their, their testing on that. We usually recommend once or twice a year, you know, that way in case anything changes because some things do change between, you know, January to, you know, December, you know, uh, servers get built, environments change, applications change, et cetera. Those need to be uh, identified and then test it accordingly and, and just ensure that the, everything that you do is documented and still works. The, the other side of that too is like, you know, and, and I know we talk a lot about, you know, the, the, infra, the infrastructure side of things, your servers and your applications, et cetera. But something else to think about too within that is, you know, backups and, and recovery from, from a workstation perspective, even though a lot more cloud applications and in, in, in Microsoft's kind of, you know, with the 365 has the ability to keep everything in the cloud and back up to the cloud, but a lot of individuals still maintain a lot of stuff locally. And where something's happened where laptop gets stolen, it gets broke, it dies, et cetera. What is your policy for that? There's some other things that need to be looked at, not just in the uh, application and production side of things, but also at the desktop level too. And I think a lot of people really kind of forget about that and, and assume that, oh, well, we'll just replace it and everything will be fine. Well, depending on who that individual is, it could be critical, you know, where they have some key documents that were on there that they can't recover or, or key information that can't be recovered, so. Yeah, stolen or lost uh, laptops are their own disaster recovery. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yeah. Itself. And that leads into a lot of other things too of like, okay, what are you doing from a, from a device management perspective? So when those do happen, you have the ability to remove, you know, wipe those clean and remove them or, or, or make the device worthless at that point. So. To finish here, I want to ask you, what different types of solutions would you recommend for disaster recovery? Um, Actually, that's a great question because it, it really, it, it all depends on their appetite and and because some things are expensive, some things are inexpensive. Uh, the questions we always ask is, okay, what's your level of loss? And when we say that, it's we don't really get into the monetary factor because usually we understand our clients' budgets and, and what they're willing to spend, but we want to understand what's your data lost expectations. And with that, we'll establish the, the backup policy and where it goes. Right now, with a lot of the cloud solutions out there, we're looking at more of creating a you know matching environment up in AWS or, or, or Azure, and then kind of having that run on a very low compute, but we're doing replication from the production environment up there on a regular basis every you know 30 minutes, 40, you know, hour or two hours daily, et cetera. And, and some clients actually want it every five minutes they have the ability and the bandwidth to do that. Uh, therefore, if something should happen to their production environment, there's triggers there that says, hey, that's down, go straight to the, to the cloud environment and work in there. And that spins up quickly and identifies and, and is able to uh, allow for users to continue to work, which is it's just pointed in a different place. That information's worked. And then once the on-premise or, or primary environment is brought back up and, and, and fixed, we just uh, replicate over and then 
flip the switch and then go back to the primary and the secondary goes back down to a small commute. And with that, the cost of operations on it is pretty inexpensive compared to buying a NAS or a backup uh, utensil or utility inside your premise versus, you know, having a third party do it or something. We found it become a lot cheaper and a lot easier and less pain to the users on the, on the back end because now they don't know. It just automatically does it. There's no like, we don't have to go through and update all the machines and do anything to point to a new location. It's all done systematically. So. I mean, like it's a lot easier to get up and running than, than oh, yeah. maybe even if you have a backup power plant in your home in case the lights go out. Yep, exactly. Well, and, and even in that situation, if, you know, during a, a true time of disaster where you're looking at a business continuity kind of plan where we have to change locations, well, as long as you have an internet connection, again, you're able to work, you know, you don't have to be in the office and you, it takes some of the VPN pieces out of it that you would have to do before instead, like, okay, if this happens, you get, here's the instructions to maintain things. So from a user perspective, it, it simplifies things a lot and it becomes unnoticeable. To them. Interesting. Well, that this is a great uh, topic, Jim. I'm sure we could talk about this for hours, but again, we would like to thank you for joining us and ask you anything today to talk again about disaster recovery. All right, Daniel. Thanks for having me. I love doing this. Uh, <laughs> thanks for everybody's time. Appreciate it. We'd like to thank Jim Timmerman for joining us today and Ask Anything to talk about disaster recovery and its potential cost to your business. Ask Anything will be back next week with another episode, continuing to dive deeper with our resident experts and what they're currently working on. If you have an idea or a topic you'd like us to explore, please reach out to us through our social media channels. In the meantime, please remember to give us a rating and subscribe to our feed wherever you get your podcasts. Until then, remember to back up and restore. So long, everybody. Go.